Good evening. Welcome to the Cuyahoga County Board of Health, and welcome to all of our outlying counties, Ashland, Ashtabula, Lorraine, and Medina. Um, my name is Karen Seidman, and I am with the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. Today, we are here for um, information about access and functional needs people, but we do have three presenters from the Cuyahoga County Board of um, Developmental Disabilities. We are going to have, each presentation will be about 30 minutes. The goal, as it has been, is to plan an operating emergency shelter to point to dispensing in Northeast Ohio that responses to the needs of all community members. The objective for this one is to describe the differences between developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities and to identify at least three concerns, considerations, and or changes that might be needed a shelter or a pod to accommodate people who um, people with developmental disabilities and for intellectual disabilities. So I'm going to turn the program over to our first presenter. The first presenter tonight is Kathy Biddlestone. Kathy has 33 years of nursing experience, primarily in um, developmental disabilities and home health care. She has worked for 18 years as the Cuyahoga County um, Board of DD as a um, first nursing as a residential nurse in group homes as a workshop nurse and is currently the infection control quality assurance nurse for Cuyahoga County Board of DD. Additionally, she is an um, American Heart Association BLS instructor, a medication administration trainer, and teaches all the bloodborne pathogen material, um, material for the Board of DD. Kathy? Good evening. Just to correct one thing, I haven't just left Patty Higgins, my nurse manager, wonder where has she been for 18 years in the county? <laughs> I worked in the field of DD for 18 years. Part of that was in the residential care, um, working with individuals who were living in group homes. I then came to the county about four years ago, worked as a site nurse in one of our workshops, and now I'm the infection control nurse. So I didn't want Patty to wonder where I've been for 14 years, that she didn't know where I was. Well, we're here to talk to you as representatives of the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disability. Part of um, Karen's introduction may have been a little confusing to you, and hopefully, hopefully I will clarify some of the confusion about the terms intellectual and developmental disability, because those may be new to you, and we'll kind of talk about that as we go. One of the things that I want to capture more than anything, um, although individuals with DD or developmental disabilities have differences from us in many, many ways. They are very much like us. And I hope that you can come away with um, a flavor of that as a result of hearing from us tonight. And I really think this says it well. Things are not always what they seem. The first appearance deceives many. The intelligence of a few perceives what's been carefully hidden. If you look at a lot of our individuals, um, they look to be very impaired, especially if you see them in wheelchairs with a lot of adaptive equipment, um, but yet many times cognitively there are equal or perhaps are superior. Um, so we can't always go by what we see. And some of that is inherent in the difference between an intellectual disability and a developmental disability. So those are our objectives tonight, to help you understand the difference and specifically for a very practical approach to helping you understand what needs that our folks might have in a situation such as a shelter where you might be you know, essentially trying to care for them. Um, and I also want you to be able to anticipate some of the challenges that you may have. And you may already have some of those in your head based on previous experiences. Some of those may be very accurate. Some of those may be missed. Um, I hope that you can come away with kind of a real life picture of what um, one of our folks in a shelter situation might present you with. So you're all basically here because you are responders. Okay? We don't have to tell you what rescue is, um, but we know that it can involve walking, running, driving, seeing, hearing, or responding to directions, as well as a lot of other very high-functioning, executive-functioning type tasks. Well, if you think about the population that we serve, a lot of them have deficits in one or more of those areas. They may not be able to walk. They may not be able to run. Um, they may not be able to drive, certainly, although many of them do. You may be surprised at the number of folks that are qualifying for services with us that drive a car to their employment. 
Um, in addition, they may have visual or hearing impairments, and then they may have cognitive impairments. So for them, escape and rescue might look very difficult, different than it would for one of us. So we have to start with the basics. What is a disability? Well, a dictionary term is an expression of limitations in an individual's function within a social context that represents a, a, a substantial disadvantage. Okay, there's something about the way that they function that puts them in a place where they essentially can't compete with what we would call the typical person. It can be a number of things. It can be physical, examples such as people with cerebral palsy, uh, paraplegics, quadriplegics, and individuals with paraplegia and quadriplegia, if the injury or the deficit occurred before the age of 22, you may be surprised to know that they qualify for services under the board. Okay, now if it happens after the age of 22, they do not. So it's the age that really is the criteria. Um, people who have CDAs, you have perhaps infants, uh, premature babies that have a CDA um, very early in their life, and they qualify for services for us. Amputees, so lots of physical deficits. Certainly when we think about mental retardation or ID or DD, we think about the cognitive deficits, but it goes beyond just people who are born with a brain that doesn't function the way that ours does. It can also be uh, victims of a traumatic brain injury, um, a cerebrovascular accident, or a stroke, as well as what we call intellectual or developmental disabilities. Mental health issues, a lot of our folks, even though they have a developmental disability, have overlying mental health issues. We call that dual diagnosis, and I think Patty's going to talk about that further. So you're not only dealing with a DD, you're also dealing with perhaps, you know, a paranoid schizophrenia, perhaps a bipolar disorder, or some other mental health issue. A lot of our folks have sensory issues. You're very familiar, I'm sure, with, I think Karen actually mentioned that you've had people from perhaps from a sight center or Cleveland Hearing and Speech. Um, we have individuals who qualify for those services as well as ours because they have a sensory impairment. Emotional issues, lots of those, and certainly that would be no different than anybody who was in a disaster or in a sheltering situation. They may be exacerbated by that. Development issue, developmental disabilities are those things that we typically would have called in the past mental retardation. Down syndrome, autism, cerebral palsy, um, the gamut. Um, there's many, many, many. Um, syndromes, some well-known, some not. And then there's a combination of all of those things. Um, so the current terminology, if you've heard me say intellectual or developmental disability, that is the current correct, politically correct terminology. It's often abbreviated IDD or DD. So recently, if you pay attention, you'll notice that our name changed from the Cuyahoga County Board of Mental Retardation and Developmental Disabilities to now just Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities. Disability isn't a one-size-fits-all, okay? They're just like us. They just happen to have a disability, and that's part of what contributes to the diversity that we have in our world. The name itself can be confusing. Terminology has changed a lot over the last 200 years. You think of some of the terms that we certainly know now were very, very um, negative um, and demeaning. Um, idiots, feeble-minded. Uh, mentally deficient, then mentally disabled, then mentally handicapped, and then to the more diagnostic term, more clinical term of mental retardation, and then developmental disabilities, and then finally to intellectual disabilities. Does where we 70 are. number still mean what it used to? I'm sorry? Does the IQ of 70 still yeah. mean the same thing it does? Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. Yes, it does. Right. We're going to hold questions until the end. Rose's Law, okay, which was enacted on October 5th of 2010, President Obama signed into law the term that removed the term mental retardation, okay, from any federal legislation and replaced it with intellectual disability. Ohio adopted this change on July 7th, 2009, and all county boards and all providers then were mandated to remove the term mental retardation from their language. Uh, and this was based on a lot of advocacy groups saying that they found the term mental retardation or retardation or retard offensive. Only the name has changed. The numbers have not changed, as this gentleman Rick, um, had just mentioned. That was the next slide. Uh, it covers the same population of people who were previously diagnosed with mental retardation and anybody who was previously eligible uh, to receive services under the diagnosis of mental retardation is now eligible for those same services, only it's now under the diagnosis of intellectual or developmental disabilities, okay? 
This is really important because a lot of the terminology in federal and state um, statutes references mental retardation. So does that mean that those no laws no longer apply? No, it doesn't. Um, Individuals with Disabilities Act, Social Security Disability, Insurance, Medicaid Home and Community-Based Waivers, which is what many of our people are funded through, Citizenship and Legal Status, Early Intervention in Childhood and Educational Services, Criminal and Civil Justice Systems, tri- Training and Employment, Income, Healthcare, Housing Zone, and even FEMA all reference the term mental retardation, which is now interchangeable with the new term DD. So we're talking about like 19.3% of the 257.2 million people who are the general popu- population of the United States as of the last census. 49 million people. Of course, that number will vary depending on what group you ask. So intellectual disability, we're going to differentiate, this is the next slide, between intellectual disability and developmental disability because they are not equal. Okay, this is characterized by significant limitations both in intellectual function and adaptive behavior, um, which covers many of our social skills and some of the practical things that we do as part of our daily life. An intellectual disability has to originate before the age of 18, and it, the adaptive behavior deficits have to manifest themselves in either conceptual, social, or practical adapt, adaptive skills. Things like daily living skills, bathing, toileting, dressing, functional skills. And they have to be compared with what is typical for those person's peers, considering cultural differences, language differences, differences in communication, motor skills and behavioral factors, okay? But these people, in in spite of the fact that they may have intellectual disabilities, they also have many, many strengths. And we do planning for our folks annually, and one of the things we always ask about is what are this individual's strengths? We don't always want to focus on on the weaknesses. So IDD, this takes us back to this gentleman's question. This is the next slide. We always talk about 70 as being the cutoff points in terms of IQs, and I'm certainly not a psychologist. Um, but we still use those same differentiations, those same numbers, if you will, to differentiate between borderline, mild, moderate, severe, and profound mental retardation or developmental disability. So those numbers have not changed for diagnostic criteria. A developmental disability is a little bit different. It's a severe chronic disability. It could be a traumatic brain injury. It could be a motor vehicle accident that results in an amputation and perhaps some some neurological deficit. It has to be manifested before the age of 22, and it has to be likely to continue indefinitely. If somebody has a traumatic event, but then they have a a pretty good potential for full recovery, that's not going to be considered a developmental disability. The other key definition for developmental disability is that it has to result in a substantial functional limitation in at least three of these areas. Self-care, things like bathing, toileting, feeding, dressing, receptive and expressive language, the ability to either understand written or verbal communication or to speak. The other things are learning, mobility. So we talk about people who may have, you know, wheelchair use. Uh, self-direction, capacity of independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. So you can see that there can be a wide variety of people who meet the criteria for being developmentally disabled, and they may look just like us. These are examples of some developmental disabilities, many of which may be familiar to you, some which may not. Epilepsy or seizure disorders, autism and autism spectrum disorder, certainly is something that we hear about on the news all the time. The statistics continue to change about how many children are affected either with autism or with, which are on the spectrum, perhaps having Asperger's syndrome or pervasive developmental disability. All of those are diagnostic criteria on the actual autism spectrum. Fetal alcohol um, syndrome, lead poisoning, something that I'm sure that you know, people here at the Board of Health work with a lot. Intellectual disabilities, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, prader willi syndrome, which is a, an eat, form of an eating disorder that is congenital, it's genetic. Um, hearing and vision impairment and cystic fibrosis. Those are just some examples. There are some many, many others that you probably have never heard of. So the difference is everybody who has an intellectual disability has a developmental disability. However, not all people with a developmental disability have an intellectual 
if that makes sense to you. Envision somebody perhaps who is a quadriplegic, the Christopher Reeves of the world, if you will. Had that injury happened to Christopher Reeves before he was 22, he would have been considered developmentally disabled. Cognitively, we realized that he wasn't impaired, but physically, he obviously very, very, was very much impaired. That's the distinguishing difference. So when you see a person with either ID or IDD, they're obviously going to have needs much like the general population, but the difference may be that they may not be able to independently provide the care for those needs. For example, somebody with normal cognitive function and normal fine motor skills, the ability to use their hands, if they weren't able to swallow for whatever reason, if they had cancer of the throat, for example, and couldn't swallow, there's a very good likelihood that they'd be able to do their own tube feeding. Folks with disabilities, developmental disabilities, may have the need for a feeding tube, but they may not be able to provide that own care. And that's where you would come into a sheltering situation and realize that you have a person with DD that perhaps has some very distinct medical needs that you're familiar with, but that they are not going to be able to meet those needs independently. And that's what a lot of our staff in our residential services do, as well as in our vocational services and in our rehabilitation programs. So they may not be able to provide these things independently. And I'm just going to briefly give you some examples of some of the things that are going to be very familiar to you, especially if you're a healthcare provider, um, that are very similar to what the general population may have. The difference being that they may have our folks may have a need for a caregiver who has very specialized and often individual specific training. One thing that you may find, and how many of you are nurses in the audience? Any of you? Okay. One of the things that you may find somewhat mind-boggling is that in our environment, which is very unique, in our group homes, for example, and in our workshops, unlicensed staff are allowed to administer medications. There's a 14-hour class that they must attend that is taught by a registered nurse trainer such as myself. But after 14 hours, when you think back to your pharmacology and nursing school, I know that's a little bit mind-boggling. And that is something that is legal and acceptable in our environment. So a lot of our folks can self-administer their medications, but if they can't, obviously they don't all live in a setting where a nurse is involved 24 hours a day. We want to be able to give them the maximum amount of independence which led to the law changing so that our unlicensed staff could give, give medications, which would allow our folks to live independently or semi-independently in the community. One of the other things, particularly in a sheltering situation, none of us really likes, I wanted to put a video clip in here of nails on a chalkboard, because I think that's a sound that's probably disturbing to most of us, but I didn't want to uh, irritate anybody. So one of the things that's very, um, sometimes unique to our folks, especially people with autism or autism spectrum disorders, are the sensory issues. <laughs> the amount of visual or auditory feedback that they get um, is much higher than, and the way they process it is very different. They have a difficult time filtering the sensory input, and their nervous systems don't know how to block things out. If you go to YouTube and just type in how does an autist, autistic person view the world? You'll see video clips that are filmed by people with autism that will give you a perspective of how they see the world. Sometimes it's been described that visually, instead of seeing our face as a whole, it's, they see our face as though they were looking at us through a kaleidoscope. That's very overstimulating. It's hard to know what to focus on which is one of the reasons that people with autism often have a difficult time making eye contact because of those sensory issues. And those can be things like lights, noises, faces, touch, smells, textures, all kinds of things. Some of them may be very aversive to touch. They don't want even the lightest touch. And they may withdraw from it and have some very, very negative reactions to it. Others, it may just be sounds, okay? We all realize that, you know, Public areas, particularly shelters, can be somewhat chaotic, somewhat noisy. Um, and so you have to think of those things, particularly with our folks with sensory issues, um, particularly those with autism. The other thing they may present with is swallowing or feeding concerns. Obviously, people with cerebral palsy, that's a huge issue. But one of the other large populations that we're beginning to know is our folks with Down syndrome. We are finding more and more people with Down syndrome are developing dementia at a much earlier age, sometimes in the 40s and the 50s. And one of the things is 
as the dementia progresses is a loss of swallowing ability, and many of them end up with feeding tubes, many of them end up with a lot of modifications to dietary textures, as well as some of the problems that you see in the typical community where people just forget how to eat. They just forget the mechanics of chewing and swallowing. And we see that in a lot of our folks as they age, particularly those people with Down syndrome. So if there are swallowing or feeding concerns, there's a number of ways that on a daily basis we address those things. We use things like special equipment, bendable forks. I don't know why my picture of the nosy cup didn't show up. But it's a cup that has the nose cut out so that someone doesn't have to tip their head back as far. People with cerebral palsy sometimes have a difficult time doing that because of spasticity. Um, so there's a lot of adaptive equipment that sometimes people use on a daily basis in order to maintain their independence and feed themselves, which is wonderful, but if they show up at a shelter without it, they're not going to be able to be self-sufficient in that way. We have folks that use the Velcro utensils. Maybe they can't grip, but once the spoon is attached to their hand, they can feed themselves scoop plates, Dyson mats, all kinds of adaptive equipment that the occupational therapists have equipped them with to promote their independence. And I won't belabor these points. I just want you to kind of get a flavor of some of the things that our folks use on a regular basis, on a daily basis, in order to perform the tasks that we take for granted a lot of times. Again, if they can't swallow it all safely, then we have a lot of folks with tube feedings. They may receive all of their nutrition, some of it, and just maybe medications, it varies. Some people will be able to eat small amounts just for oral gratification, just for the sensation and the pleasure of eating, but primarily depend on a feeding tube for their nutrition and their hydration. And once again, these may be folks that don't have the capability of doing this themselves, either because of fine motor problems or cognitive issues. They have specialized medical needs, but they take medications just like we do. Some of them are very capable of administering their own medications, in other cases, they need someone to do that for them. They may not have the resources to be able to refill their own medications, for example. They may come in with no medications and not even know what pharmacy they use. Okay, so that could be a problem. <clears throat> Once again, we have an aging population. Our folks are living longer and they're developing the same chronic illnesses that the general population is, and in some cases, even more so. A lot of our folks are on psychotropic drugs, which lead to non-insulin-dependent diabetes, we have a tremendous number of diabetics with developmental disabilities. Some of them can give their own insulin, particularly if they can use an insulin pen, but many of them rely on a glucometer four times a day to check their blood sugar. They may also rely on staff to administer insulin, once again, something that unlicensed personnel can do with an additional four hours of training. And actually, they do it really well. It's very, very scary, I know, for nurses, but actually, our rate of medication errors in our field is very, very low compared to some other settings. So we have to deal with diabetics coming into shelters. We have folks with respiratory issues, cerebral palsy, um, cystic fibrosis that use a lot of the same equipment. Once again, nebulizers, inhalers. They have trachs. We have people with trachs that ride our buses, that come to our day programs, and they get suctioned. They get the same care that anybody with a trach would get in what we might consider a nursing home, but at home, or in our workshops, or in their group homes. They use oxygen, they use CPAP, all of the same respiratory problems and measures that the typical population uses, our folks use, but they may need more assistance. Another thing, obviously, is seizures. Okay? We know that seizures are part of the general population, but certainly individuals with ZD have a higher incidence of seizures just because of the amount of damage to their brain. It helps to know what those triggers are. We certainly advocate, and Tim's going to talk about our support administrators, and they can identify in their plan, their annual plan, what those triggers for seizures are, whether it's menses, heat, stress, fever, whatever. It's always useful to know those things. If you have someone coming into your shelter, it's interesting and, and helpful to know what are the triggers for them. Obviously, we take the same precautions to protect them from harm, but a lot of our folks have some unusual medications. They may use diastat, which is a rectal form of Valium. We're starting to use intranasal Versac, um, which is in a nose spray. And once the seizure starts, we use this intranasal Versed, and it acts similar to Valium in stopping the seizure activity. We use some sublingual forms of medications that may typically not be used 
in the general population where we can put them in under the tongue or in, on the cheek to help it dissolve even if somebody isn't able to swallow. So we have some different strategies for managing seizures that you may not be familiar with or accustomed to. We also have folks with equipment needs that are very specialized, often customized, and therefore not readily available. One wheelchair does truly not fit all in our case. We have folks with very, very sophisticated speech and language um, communication abilities, whether it's just a picture board, and certainly that would be something that would be of great value in a shelter, at least that they could point to what they needed. Um, a lot of our folks with autism um, use schedule boards where they can see in a visual way what their schedule is going to look like, and we realize in a shelter that schedule is going to be turned upside down. Um, they also have very, very sophisticated electronic devices, such as the one that you see in the red, and now we have progressed to using iPads. We have iPads and our speech pathologists are beginning to build programs for the iPads that we are using in a number of our um, day programs for people with speech and language deficits to be able to communicate using their iPads. And those are certainly much more portable and much more accessible. And you may find that you, people come in, if they present with one of these devices, obviously they need electricity to charge it. Um, if they don't have it, they may truly be without a voice. They may be very capable of telling you what they need if they have their device. But without it, they are literally nonverbal. Physical mobility, some very typical things, such as a standard walker or a rolling walker. But then we have folks that use gait trainers that need a lot more support. We have children particularly that use the reverse walkers. We use gait belts. Many of our folks require a hydraulic lift or a Hoyer lift or some of our homes and our facilities are even equipped with overhead tracking which actually is built into the ceiling and then it has a lifting device attached to it and those, those can actually be tracked from room to room to room. So if you have a family member who has a child who's non, uh, unable to ambulate or unable to transfer, they can literally pick them up using this device and literally move them on this tracking from the bathroom to their bedroom, into the living room or to the dining room, wherever that tracking is. Obviously, in a shelter, we're not going to have that. We're going to have to rely a lot more on our own muscle power, gate belts, or perhaps, if we're lucky, a hydraulic lift. We have folks that are obviously immobile that require very, very sophisticated wheelchair seating and positioning to prevent skin breakdown. Um, these are just a couple of examples. We have folks that have very, very, you know, talk about Cadillacs. There are some reclining power chairs out there, like the one that you see on the left, that rival the price of some Cadillacs out there because they're customized, literally. They may have um, very, very sophisticated controls so that the person can either use one finger if they can, or perhaps their forehead if they have no other movement, perhaps um, by um, sucking or by blowing air into a mechanism, they can move their chair. So they can become very expensive. But once again, the operative term is power. If you don't have power, the chair isn't going to work. If you have a 200-pound person in a 450-pound chair, mobility becomes a problem. The smallest ramp can be a really big mountain show this one little video clip if I can. I think it's kind of a great tribute to the Olympics. If you uh, look at your one of your little handouts with a bookmark that is a hologram, which I thought was really apt because the title of my presentation was It's Not Always Like It Seems. But this, you'll see on there, says the Sprout Film Festival. That's a film festival that's comprised of film clips that are all made by people with developmental disabilities. Um, and you'll see the website down there. But this particular clip is one that I thought was very timely in terms of the Olympics. How many of you can relate to that? <laughs> so much easier to lay there on the couch and watch the Olympics. But if we would just go for it. So once again, an example that they are so much more like this than different. Kim's going to talk more about resources, but certainly you recognize some of the equipment needs in home health care agencies, home health departments, retail stores, hospices, hospital supply companies, mobility companies, we recognize that in certain disasters and emergencies, access to those places could be very limited. Um, so the more planning that we can do, and certainly that is a function of our agency, uh, the more that we can do in terms of planning for these type of situations, the less burden it would put on a shelter or similar situation for you in terms of the equipment. Some of the additional challenges that have been posed to um, in sheltering situations that we have learned 
over some of the past disasters is that some of our folks are inappropriately referred to medical facilities for what people perceive to be a medical problem, when that's just their baseline. That's normal for them. And if you don't know that, or if there's not a caregiver there to tell you, it's very easy just to say, oh, they need to be in a hospital. No, they need, that's how they function every day. That puts a burden on hospitals and emergency rooms that are going to obviously already be under-resourced and overpopulated. So we look at their disability as an acute medical situation when it's not. That is just part of their disability. And then once again, we have the situation where we have had people refuse to be served based on mislabeling or misunderstood conditions. And so those can all be challenges, and that's one of the reasons that I think that Karen has brought us all here together is to help us to overcome some of those things. Our mission as a board is to support and empower people with developmental disabilities to live, learn, work, and play in the community, and that's certainly what we strive to do. <laughs> oh, that lovely sound? Well, that was a song, if you would be interested. There's a gentleman by the name of Scott James that wrote a song called Through My Eyes. He's a gentleman with autism. He didn't write the song, I'm sorry, he performs the song, and he actually is going to an international like a competition with this song. He has a wonderful, amazing voice. You would never know that this is a man with any disability. Um, so I apologize that it won't play. But if you're so interested, go to uh, YouTube and just Google Scott James through my eyes. <laughs> Your last slide basically talks about the services that we provide as a board. Um, and it certainly uh, is helpful to you to know that we're out there and that every other county has a board just like our, well, not necessarily just like ours, but certainly a board of people to, you know, to serve people with disabilities. Questions? Questions, we're going to start with Ashland County. Ashland, do you have any questions? Uh, what is the website for the video? The video of the, of the gentleman in the, uh, with the Olympic dream is Sprout Film Festival. It should be on your slide. And then if you want to listen to the song by Scott James, just go to YouTube and Google Scott James through my eye. Um, Tim, I think you're the next one up. Tim O'Malley is our next presenter. Tim has approximately 25 years of service with the Board of PD, and um, he has held positions um, as a support administrator, coordinator of intake and assessment, and supervisor of contract agencies. His current role is as a liaison based at Metro Health Medical Center, and he works to improve the access to health care for individuals with DD. Um, he also works PRN is an RN, and um, he has been doing that since 1991, currently employed at University Hospital. So Tim's going to talk to us today about um, disaster preparedness for people with um, developmental disabilities. Good evening. Glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully you can learn something. The title of my presentation is Disaster Preparedness for Individuals with Developmental Disabilities. Uh, some of the objectives today to discuss disaster preparation in individuals with developmental disabilities give an overview of the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities, what we can and can't do, describe some real-life situations with support administration, those case managers in our agency, that will talk about disaster planning, sheltering, evacuation, and community resources. And before I get started to the next slide, let me preface this. I know that a number of individuals out there are well experienced, have a wealth of, uh, probably between us, we might have between 70 and 80 years I don't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing you out there with the Medical Reserve Corps, nurses, volunteers, a wealth of experience, disaster preparation for individuals with developmental disabilities is somewhat new to us. Preparing for that disaster, that evacuation, that possible sheltering. I think in the next couple of slides, what I'm trying to do is really illustrate that I'm confident that we can come to some of the same conclusions that you have. That one, it relies on self-responsibility. Educating our individuals about preparing and being prepared in the event of an emergency. Shared responsibility. If I have an individual that cares for me and I'm disabled, I need to notify that individual and have a backup plan. And three, first responders, volunteers, and all the other individuals involved in the agencies, that what is going to happen is that, is that you want somebody showing up to your shelter that's most prepared, offering information to assess their care needs. In 2009, H1N1 pandemic flus stressed the importance of potential threats and consequences that occur when the community is ill and ill-prepared. 
consumers with intellectual and neurodevelopmental disabilities are subject to the same issues as all of us. I can't stress this second sentence enough. We have more similarities than differences between us. Individuals that are capable, individuals that have disabilities. We all want the same things. We want to work. We want to be with our families. We want to be with our friends. We want to have fun. And when disaster occurs, we want to make sure that we're safe and healthy. Some of the recommendations for preventive health care for same individuals or intellectual disabilities are all for all of us. For instance, functional needs. If we take high blood pressure, if we have diabetes, we're all going to show up if we're out without our medication for the next three days or so. Some of the evidence that we're coming to the same conclusions with this as far as our county agency that in 68 we know that 34,000 people lost their lives due to the pandemic. And almost less than 100 years ago, we're talking well over 500,000 people. Public health experts worldwide continue to watch and make plans and deal with potential pandemic in the form of avian flu. Uh, while no current pandemic exists, the potential for one does exist. Person-to-person -person spread causing serious illness sweeping across the country and world in a very short time. This is doom and gloom, but it is reality. Look what's happening in our agency and in our country and across the world. We're talking about H2, is it H2N3? H3N2, all the buzzwords. Swine flu at the local county uh, affairs. More importantly, at Metro Health, in my job, I received as a contract employee, as did other uh, Metro Health employees there, both clinical and non-clinical, that by August 15th, you need to have a medical reason why you would not receive, signed by a doctor, why you would not receive the next flu vaccine. So I've never seen a memo like that. In the area that I work at, at Metro Health, for the clinical and non-clinical staff that work at Metro Health, because of the seriousness, seriousness of previous illnesses across the country, what they've asked all staff to do is by August 15th, present a signed note from a doctor that would exclude them from receiving a free vaccine as an employee. So in, in instance, Carolina County is vulnerable to many hazards, all of which have a potential and disrupt community, cause damage, and create mass casualties. We all know that. The jurisdictions within Cuyahoga County have robust response and recovery capabilities. That's the reason that you're here at 7.15 this evening and out there in remote sites. You're making a commitment to be here. Potential hazards, we all know. Floods, tornadoes, high winds. What hasn't Ohio experienced in the last couple of months or a year, actually? Utility failure. I know there was an earthquake probably about six months ago. As far as civil disorder, I don't know that there's been any civil disorder. Uh, I know that Jimmy Haslam uh, purchased the Browns team and he uh, <laughs> agreed not to move them yet, so perhaps that's, that's a good thing. Infectious disease outbreak and hazardous material spill. Hazardous material spill, I know that there were a couple of train derailments in southern Ohio not that long ago. Uh, the utility failure off a little further uh, would, as far as southern, excuse me, central Ohio, experienced for a week, week and a half. I don't know what the 88 counties, and the counties specifically in the central Ohio, did to respond to their individuals and help them. That's something that we need to find out. We live near nuclear power plants, obviously drought, power failure, and winter storms and temperatures are unknown to us here in the Cleveland area for sure. Emergency action levels. They all have that in the per It'd be a difficult slide to see, but at least level five is more of the local resources. And then depending on the nature of the event, we're moving from four to three to two, where those local responders are pulling in additional resources, whether that be in outlying counties, regional areas, state, or the federal government. Next slide. Given a historical problem, then, excuse me, perspective. There's little available data on the safe and efficient evacuation of persons and individuals with disabilities and in times of emergency. If we don't plan and educate our individuals that participate in our agency, there's bad outcomes that are possible. Currently, Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities serves 9,000 children, adolescents, and adults. They're in a variety of settings. They have, as Kathy mentioned, they have varying levels of intellectual and physical capabilities. Some of these individuals serve your coffee as you go through Starbucks in the morning. They cut your grass. They're selling uh, vegetables at the vegetable stand that they've grown. They have a number of different capabilities, and they, they are your neighbors. They might sit next to you in church. They live in a variety of living environments. Some are the families. Some are paid providers, nursing homes, group homes, and some live independently within the community. Yeah, they mentioned, for the most part, 
The emergency preparedness plans are designed for individuals where escape and rescue involves walking, running, driving, seeing, hearing, and quickly responding. That might not be those 9,000 individuals. That's why we're trying to plan for that. Trying to plan for self-responsibility, shared responsibility, and to learn what the first responders can do. In these six outlying counties, Lorraine, Lake, Medina, Geauga, Summit, and Portage, including Cuyahoga, there are over a quarter million individuals that can be considered over the age five having a disability. That data alone underlines the importance of developing emergency evacuation plans. System planning assumptions. Disasters differ in character by magnitude, severity, duration, how long they're going to stick around, and their frequency. We know that they're going to affect economically, physical, and social infrastructures. Disaster events will be managed independently until multiple response agencies become essential or resources are exhausted. What I want you to take away from this slide is really that we need to prepare our individuals and educate them and give them the information so they can be prepared on their own. Will they be able to stay in their shelter in place, wherever they're at, for 72 hours? If they have a provider, will they inform their provider and come up with a backup plan? If they don't have a backup plan, those are the people that we're identifying. So effective disaster preparedness requires ongoing public awareness and education to ensure they'll take appropriate action. Within our agency, we've just learned and we've talked about most recently in the past couple of weeks that there's different levels. So you have that first, that first level, that group of 9,000 individuals that we all have. We all have natural supports. We all have family, friends, uncles, aunts, neighbors, people that we sit next in church to that can help us in the time of emergency. Then there are the other individuals that have that group that are paid providers. Our agency goes out and pays a provider. Other social service agencies provide help for those individuals. That's narrowing the list even more that might be able to participate and take care of themselves in an emergency. If they don't, they need to work with those providers and come up with a backup plan. Then there's even a smaller number that might need our help, that they're reaching out to you in that time of evacuation or going to a shelter, or those are the people that Kathy and Patty and I are talking about that they're going to present to their shelter. Terminology, we sort of covered special needs, people with those hidden disabilities, mental illness, intellectual and cognitive disabilities that have visual hearing and mobility limitations that are going to affect really on the functional needs approach their independence, their understanding of communication, and arranging transportation. Now here's what I want to really get to. In the county of emergency operations plan, we are considered a support agency. We're a secondary agency that's going to support all the first responders. Each individual county in 88 counties across the state has support administrators. These are individuals like case managers that work with the individuals, their families, and provide services. They sit down with them, assess their needs, plan their needs, develop their supports, and then monitor their progress. This is your go-to person in each county, the support administrator or the case manager. They are the single point of accountability. They, they are the single point of accountability. They have knowledge about the individual's needs and their family circumstances. Regardless of an emergency, if you left here today and had a question about an individual, they could help solve those complex needs. They have access to a great deal of information and are willing and able to help. They're a great resource regarding background information, social and medical issues that will impact care during an emergency. Considerations for people with disabilities. Special needs have, individuals with special needs have unique needs that require more detailed planning in the event of disaster. We all know that. And that's what we're getting at. Taking a look, preparing individuals themselves. What can they do to prepare themselves? If they work with a provider, what can they do with that provider to make other arrangements? And then the third group, those individuals that might present to your shelter or that we might need to reach out to as first responders and volunteers. We went on, there's a wealth of information about disaster preparedness in individuals. I just went on, actually, the National Organization on Disability. There's a flyer that came out, Disaster Readiness Tips for Individuals with Development and Cognitive Disabilities. I printed that out right from the web. I'm showing the audience here. It's a nice pamphlet. And give the families preparation. 
They also have one for individuals with sensory disabilities, owners of pets and service animals, people with general disabilities, and people with mobility disabilities. Who does what and when? Again, getting back to that self-responsibility, shared responsibility, and first responder actions. It's our responsibility as staff in the agency, we feel, to prepare our individuals and their families for an event of emergency. That shared responsibility of working with others. So they need to learn their community, and you're here tonight trying to figure out what we do and how you can access and help with our concern, help with our resources and supports. And then, most importantly, at the end, first responder reaction and considerations. Developing a backup plan. We all have need to inform caregivers, and I'm speaking of the consumers. So taking a look at that approach, and that we have those 9,000 individuals that are out there, we have varying levels of disabilities and abilities. We're helping them develop a backup plan. Informing caregivers, friends, family, neighbors, and others who might be able to help during an emergency. All the basics, we all know that. Some of our people need reminders. All of our people need reminders. Stock up on food, water, and unnecessary prescription medications, medical supplies, and have enough to last one week. We all know that. I'm not telling you anything, but it's our responsibility to educate our consumers. You are not going to have 9,000 of our individuals show up at your shelters. You're going to have a handful of people that are probably most medically fragile or had to leave an area because of an evacuation or some type of event. Self-responsibility. Making a list of emergency contact information and keeping it handy. We're throwing around and kicking around a couple ideas here, at least for individuals that they can work with their local doctor. And I don't have a slide, but it's actually a plastic sleeve that they can work with their local doctor and come up with a sort of a snapshot, who they are as an individual, keeping their medications and their allergies on the back and on the front sort of giving a profile. Keep that on the refrigerator. So in an event of an emergency, somebody could pull that if somebody, a firefighter shows up or a first responder shows up or somebody says, there's a train wreck, there's a plume of smoke, you need to get out, you have 10 minutes. They can pull that off the refrigerator and go. Some things that you might have on here include this is an individual, she's sort of complex, but she's typical in our agency. She's a 21-year-old female with spina bifida, hydrocephalus, with a trach and a G2. Uh, she makes vocalizations, and she's able to understand and give mouth responses. She lives with her single mom. They live in a family home. She uses catheter. She also has a wheelchair. She has a gastronomy tube, gastronomy tube excuse me. Um, she has respiratory issues, so she has a trach. Uh, she uses a vent 10 hours a day when she sleeps and two or three hours after school. The balance of that time, she's on oxygen. So just presenting that, giving that idea out to our individuals, how they can prepare themselves so that they do have to go to a shelter. This is who I am. This is a snapshot of me. And here's my medications on the back and here are my allergies. It makes it a little easier to triage once that individual walks in the door. Shared responsibility. Understanding, most importantly, that we're getting back to the education of our next slide, understanding that we're getting back to the education of our clients and our families, our consumers, that they need to have realized that you've left your family to take care of them. So the better prepared that they are, you can help them out. Understanding that if they do have a personal care attendant that from another agency, they need to have a backup plan that provides another location. That might not happen, but in the event that they do have a backup, backup plan and that can work out, that's great. If they don't, then they need to go to a shelter and they can present with more inf information that would be helpful. They need to work with other things and consider. If they have to live in an apartment, they can talk to the manager of the apartment. I'm on the fifth floor. I have a wheelchair. I don't have access in case there's a fire or an event. I need to help be evacuated. So when those first responders do show up, they can get that information to to the critical staff that can make the decision to get them moving and in a safe place. More importantly, first responders. I can't stress enough that you need to get out and understand us a little bit more. Reach out. There's 88 counties across the state of Ohio. Uh, there's probably six or seven represented here tonight, locally and otherwise. You have access to individuals and staff that have over 45 years, almost 50 years of experience working with individuals with developmental disabilities. As I said, you probably sit next to them in church. You probably ride with them on the bus. 
sit, eat in the same restaurants with them. They might have served coffee with you. Go out, get to know them. We will welcome your visits and get to know us and how that is. Maybe whether that be like Geauga County, Lorain County, wherever it might be, reach out. Get to know your staff. The next slide, we're talking a little bit about emergency special needs shelters and children with technology dependencies, some things that Kathy talked about. Realistically, what I want to take away from this slide is what can and can't be done. And all the more reason that we're trying to educate our individuals about how they need to prepare for themselves, their families, in the event of an emergency. I'm reading from email from April 18, 2012. It's from a doctor at Baylor College of Medicine in the Special Needs Primary Care Clinic at Texas Children's Hospital. She's describing what they dealt with in the aftermath of Hurricane Ike in Galveston, Texas. And this was to try and come about with better solutions in preparing individuals for emergencies, but also first responders. During Ike, our clinic was fairly new, approximately 250 to 300 patients. So we kind of went into it blind. The hospital was in potential evacuation area, so patients were told not to come here. We had families call and register with 211, which I'll mention a little later what it is locally, which did not seem to make any difference in the weeks following the hurricane when most of us were living in the dark. Most of the families made their own arrangements or survived with home generators that they had to purchase or borrow. Communication was tough, but the old landlines were the only way to communicate because cell phones were out. We had some families that went to hospitals and nursing facilities, but that was first come, first serve. Families said in those cases they had to provide their own food and supplies and care without respite. One family said basically they were provided with an electrical outlet for their equipment and glad to get it. In most instances, only the patient and one caregiver were allowed to shelter in these facilities, so a parent had to leave the other child with relatives in order to remain with the disabled individual. Just keeping things in perspective. When things are going to go bad, the better that we can prepare our individuals, prepare their families, the less people they're going to see at your doors. Anybody have a phone? Anybody have? Write this down. <laughs> There's our website. Iowa County Board of BD. It will be on all three of our presentations, I believe, but that's probably one important website. Each, again, each county has a Board of Developmental Disabilities. You can access access that, County Board of Developmental Disabilities, go to links, and there will be literally hundreds of links. All the other county boards of developmental disabilities, all the local organizations with resource information, phone numbers, what we do as an agency, and what we can and can't do. There's general disability information in there, along with uh, resources and contacts. If you take away one thing tonight, I'd go on that site, visit it, or put it in your phone and visit it sometime soon. We all know that emergencies happen Monday through Friday, 8th and 4th. <laughs> if you want to contact your support administrator, they're there, there after hours, too. But there's our number there, that single point of accountability, that, that support administrator, that case manager, that person who's going to link you with information about the individual you're calling about. After hours, or the AHOC system is after 4.30 p.m. on Friday at 8 a.m. But realistically, again, I want you to take away the more that we, as our, as our staff, can educate the individuals involved in our agency and their families, the less people are going to show up at your door. But those are the numbers that are available. Here's what we're currently doing. For uh, we realize that we're in uh, negotiations right now with the local Red Cross and development procedures for sheltering. Um, we had an opportunity to visit Franklin County and Franklin County Board of Developmental Disabilities and their lo the local Red Cross chapter. They already have a shelter that's designated for individuals with special needs. I think there needs to be some negotiation and an idea of responsibility about when that shelter might open, but it's something that we're taking a look at right now. Frank for Franklin County, it works for us, them. We've met with some of our top administration in Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities, and given that we have 9,000 people at the board, we're considering those. We've gotten out of the school business in the last couple of years, so our, we have schools and facilities that are open. They meet sort of the criteria that Red Cross would take a look at. They have a gymnasium for a large uh, population. They have cafeteria. They have showering facilities. They have a pool. And more importantly, sometimes they have equipment, the lifts, and so forth, uh, the feeding tubes, all that equipment that might be necessary to open that up. Something we're taking a look at. Something we're also taking a look at is here developing with our individuals and their family 
Emergency Management Prepared Kit. It's something that is available online. There is a readiness checklist that an individual, if they had the shelter, could take from home. It has important people and papers and be prepared to go to the shelter. So sort of like that snapshot describing here, the laminate. It doesn't matter what mechanism it is, as long as if they have to show up for a shelter because of an evacuation, what information are they communicating to you as first responders and volunteers at that shelter that would be most helpful to them to move them through the triage process? Now I'm on the current slide, plan ahead for emergencies. Emergency management has three phases, planning, response, and recovery. Again, I can't stress enough, people with disabilities have the right to participate in all phases planning for, responding to, and recovery from emergencies. Get them involved in the local planning process. We welcome that. I know and I'm confident the surrounding communities will welcome that. The more that we can keep our individuals safe, the better off we all are. We're trying to teach our individuals that we have the responsibility to plan ahead for an emergency because they know their needs the best. And if they communicate those to family, friends, providers, that's the best that we can do. Uh, some of the things we talked about, the local ADA guide, I'll hold it up in the audience, but it is available from the Department of Justice, an actual ADA guide for local governments, making community preparedness and response programs accessible to people with disabilities, Department of Justice. It's got pictures, what to do, transportation, mobility concerns, setting up accessible shelters, good resources. The things that we're trying to do in all of this, again, is to make that individual prepared. Like all of us, you're leaving your family, your friends, whoever it might be, to go care for other individuals. Hopefully you've made those preparations for the people that you're leaving behind. We're asking our individuals to do the same. Have a backup plan. Uh, there's some promising practices out there that are available on the website uh, and locally as far as people that have gone through this before. We're not the first. Uh, following our examples of programs geared toward addressing gaps in emergency management and planning for at-risk individuals. Uh, one specifically, I don't have a picture of it, but it's taken from the National Council on Disability for effective emergency management for people with disabilities. Also, locally out of Kansas, there's a special needs toolkit for planning for pandemic flu and mapping. Uh, the toolkit provides detailed instructions on how to assess the needs of elderly people with disabilities, things that Patty yeah, will probably talk about when we come in. Um, I'm sure you're more familiar. I don't need to talk about the Ready, Room and Enable. There's all types of different online courses that are available. Some of the new practices that are out there are registries. There's good and bad and ugly about registries. Registries have emerged as a possible means of identifying people. But the registry gives people a false sense of confidence in some ways. You're out there. They know that they registered. They're waiting for somebody to come rescue them. Have they planned for themselves? Have they planned for their family? Have they informed providers that I'm going to need help? Or are they just waiting for somebody to come that might or might not come? Talked about the special needs shelters. Those special needs shelters, hopefully they'll develop a little bit more. They will be a place where medical, behavioral, and social considerations can receive appropriate attention. So if we negotiate with the Red Cross, and for whatever reason, there's a huge number of people that show up to a general population shelter, and that Red Cross administration talks to our administration and said, let's open up your special needs shelter at one of your schools or east side location or west side, wherever it might be, based on the event. We can develop and maintain some of the same goals that would be in the general population, but address their needs. Goals of safety, shelter, and early reunification. Re Just trying to get them back home. Everybody wants to be home and safe. That shelter would offer a quiet space addressing specific needs concerning mobility, feeding, transfers, toilet. They have, we already have the infrastructure. We have uh, backup generators, that gymnasium, a cafeteria, showering facility. So something to consider that we're taking a look at in the event of a bigger event. Trying to prepare people for these shelters, we're going through the process of a screening questionnaire. Can they live 72 hours alone? Are they life dependent on electricity? Have they informed the local power company, the fire department, that they might have to be notified? Do they have a, are they oxygen dependent or ventilator dependent at all? Is there a visible sign that there's oxygen in the house? When a fire truck rolls up and a squad rolls up, they're going in to see the person. If they see that 
little decal, that might help them out in this for a second. But they're reacting to what they see on the scene. Do they have that current list of medications that we talked about? Can they leave in five minutes? Who can leave their house in five minutes? I don't know. <laughs> With everything they want. Talk about 211. Cuyahoga County has a 211 system. Most of the local counties have 211 systems, but I included other areas in here about Asheville, Jug, and some of the other surrounding counties. If you dial 211 in an emergency, you'll get a lot of good information. Information about prescription currently without any meds. Prescription drugs, where to get a health care uh, provider, wherever it might be. Uh, based on some of the things that physicians spoke about in Galveston, the people that are working at 211 might end up calling 911. It doesn't look like it's a matter of that information goes out the window. So the better prepared that we can be, the better off we all be. Uh, something that we haven't touched on again, there are individuals that we live, work, play in, in the community. They, like all of us, they might attend church or other religious organizations, and we haven't reached out to those faith-based organizations. They know the individuals that might attend their church and can com communicate to them in a way that help them understand shelter in place and prepare them and their family in case they need to uh, leave or prepare for an event community emergency. Those are some of the resources that I said. Really, a number of the things are online. The National Organization on Disability, I received some things from the Justice Department. There is ADA guides on emergency preparedness. But what I want you to take away from it, be confident that we as an agency are really trying to work with our individuals, our staff, our families, and better prepare them so they don't show up at your show. Thank you, Tim. Um, we are going back to our, so this time we're going to start with, let's see, Medina County. Medina County, do you have any questions? We do. One moment, please. Do we have a register ready um, effort in Medina County or in our region? Are you asking if you have a registry in your county? Yes. Your first responders would be able to tell you that, and sometimes it's done by individual communities. Okay. And I would suggest that you get in touch, if you are interested, get in touch with probably the local fire department or your EMA in your county, and they probably would know that. I know in, pre I know in preparation for my presentation that I work PRN with an assistant chief in Cleveland Fire. He said, sure, we're going to break down the registry. We're going to do what needs to be necessary as far as responding. But our, when that call comes in to respond, are we going to look five pages down? Is that person part of our registry? No. They're going to show up on scene. And the things that are going to be immediate, can I leave the house? What's more immediate to that person? So, but as far as the registry, like I said, there's good and bad. To Does that help at all? Thank you. Yes. Um, Cuyahoga County, Diane. I just wanted to clarify that call 211 gets just in an emergency, or is it something you can access at other times? Other times. Access at other times. And I encourage you they, they have, they can connect you to a lot of services. They have massive um, database of what services are available. Can anybody in the community can call. It's run here by United Way, but in other places in Texas, Texas state government runs their 211 system. Their training level is pretty good. Uh, their training they, level they is... They can pretty tell good. someone how to find resources, actually direction yes. in... And they can sometimes other. make appointments for people yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Debbie, let's take that and then, then we'll move on to the next so, guest. I think I already have the answer. I was going to ask if most of them recorded or live. The 211, you talk to a person, definitely, real quickly. Yes. Yes, I, I have a question. If if we had to open a shelter and the Red Cross opened a shelter next week, and we and say it was a community-based shelter, a local shelter, and we had a good percentage of people that presented with special disabilities, what are we going to do as the shelter workers, the nurses and healthcare providers, to help meet the needs, these special needs? Is there someone we can call to get wheelchairs, toilet lifts, ramps. I mean, you're, we talk about there's, we're developing something like the Franklin County has, but what do we have next week if we need it? I, I think that, at least from our county, 
County Board of Development Disabilities. There's something in between. We've discussed the possibility of having sort of a, a team, or at least access to a team. So if that team does develop, it's not that individual support industry. It's going to be overwhelmed by the 10 people that might show up. But perhaps somebody with negotiation, can you have resources that will go over to that shelter, or at least be accessible by phone or email or whatever? These are the individuals that are presenting at our shelter. What are, what are they presenting with? And walk you through some of those things. But where do we get things that we might need? Durable supplies. So we got somebody that yes. evacuates. They don't have enough time to get their equipment, and now they show up at a shelter, and we don't have the resources to care for them. Red Cross does have a mechanism to get in touch. If they can't get the, the equipment that's needed, they would probably work through the local EMA to get the equipment. So Red Cross knows how to access that. Um, our third speaker today is also from the Cuyahoga County Board of Health, and just let me mention that um, I think in some of the other communities um, there may be somebody present at your presentation from your local board of DD, and if not, and you need to get in touch with them, um, I'm sure someone here can help you with that, or someone in your community can. Um, our next speaker is Patty Higgins, and Patty has been a registered nurse for 36 years. She is the currently the um, she has been a director of nursing for 60 bed ICF DD unit, and she can explain that to us. Um, and for three years, um, she did that, and then um, as a nurse manager, um, as the nurse manager for the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities, and she has been there for 19 years. Patty is also the mother of two children with developmental disabilities, um, one who's 29 and one who's 31. So Patty is going to um, talk to us today about um, etiquette. Thank you. Just one quick comment about Tim's presentation. We have, um, we are currently working with Warrensville Developmental Center. They have cottages where they keep, where individuals live. And since they are trying to move people out of that setting, there are probably four or five that we're looking to use as shelters with them. And there would be equipment available. There would be things like that. So we are looking at that. And as Tim mentioned, also teams of people who could assist, uh, groups of our staff who could also assist in, in getting what you need. What I'm going to talk about is developmental disability etiquette. And that's basically how you can work with our folks. It's not really about the equipment. It's more how can we communicate with them? How do we understand what their needs are, especially if they're not verbal or they don't communicate in the regular way? And then also how would we deal with behaviors with individuals with developmental disabilities? The objectives for the presentation, um, to identify different modes of communication that individuals with DD utilize. Kathy identified some of them. Discuss general communication strategies when working with individuals with DD. And identify actions to take when individuals with DD have behavioral issues. I think you're going to find as I talk, you may be able to identify people that you've already worked with perhaps in a disaster situation people who may have mental health issues, people who may have Alzheimer's, um, people who just are really upset during a disaster situation. Some of the same communication skills that work with those folks are also going to work with our folks as well. There are a lot of myths about people with developmental disabilities, partly because in, some people don't understand what developmental disabilities are, uh, what what um, their abilities are. And so one of the myths is people with DD cannot understand speech, let alone medical information. Premise number one, many people with developmental disabilities can effectively communicate their needs. They may not communicate in the traditional standard ways that you're used to, but they can communicate in many different ways, and we'll talk about that. People with DD have a, have a wide variety of communication skills. Next slide, premise number one, uh, there are pictures of the ways that individuals can communicate, individuals with DD. Kathy showed you the touch talkers. She showed you um, some of the technology. Our folks can use com computers. Um, they can also use special programs to help them write. 
they use sign language. And individuals who are nonverbal can also communicate in, so in ways by gestures. And you can see the pictures there. The gentleman on the top is happy, and it looks like the young lady on the bottom is in some type of pain. As far as medical information, many people with DD are very involved in their health care. Health care providers may have to adapt their environments and their interaction techniques, and that's hard for a lot of health care providers because that takes time. And I know a lot of physicians are on that 15-minute appointment schedule. So talking with someone who has developmental disabilities is going to take more time, more resources, more understanding, more patience. Another myth number two is people with DD cannot make decisions. People with DD participate in decision making in many different ways. Many individuals are their own guardians, and that is something that a lot of people don't understand. I think a lot in the medical profession, that because an individual does not have a guardian, then any medical decisions that need to be made, that individual would have to get a guardian. That's not true. Many individuals can make their own decisions about their medical care. They can also self-advocate. We had an individual who had terminal cancer, and he was able to decide. He was nonverbal, so we had to talk to him in very different ways by gestures, going over things over, over and over, reviewing things. He decided he wanted to be a DNR. All right, if you were to see this individual um, on the street, you would not think that he was capable of making his decisions, but based on a team of us working with him, we had nursing, we had speech, um, we also had occupational therapists, we had a number, of, a number of our team working with him, and he was able to make that decision. And the psychologist confirmed he could, um, confirmed he could make informed decisions. Individuals with DD are capable of informed consent for medical procedures and treatments. Sometimes when we work with hospitals, the individual comes in, has their first appointment, gets their blood work done for their procedure, and on the day that they present for their procedure, because they may have Down syndrome or because there may be a um, diagnosis of developmental disabilities, the physician refused to refuses to operate or do the medical procedure because they don't have a guardian. The myth, myth three is people with DD are sick. You can see the picture with this individual. He doesn't look sick at all. Um, the other myth is people with DD are dependent on others to meet many and all of their needs. Premise three, many people with developmental disabilities are not sick, incompetent, dependent, unintelligent, or contagious. They are like the typical population. They're healthy, some are healthy, some have chronic medical conditions, some have mental health diagnoses, and some have acute care issues. So a lot of, there are more similarities between us, all populations, and people with developmental disabilities. People in our program have master's degrees, they work full time, they can drive, they own their own businesses, they participate on committees, they're married, and they have children. They are individuals. And you use, when you're doing assessments, you, do, you use the same assessment skills that you have used with every individual that comes into the shelter. If someone has a mental illness, if someone has Alzheimer's, you would gear your assessment to the individual that is presenting before you. Triage. That's an important time for us to be talking about communication, but we also know that some of the tips I'm going to give you, such as taking your time with the individual, trying to determine what they're saying, may not be the most, triage may not be the most perfect time to talk to the individual. Um, so there may be some communication issues, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Baseline health, it's very important that we know baseline health if someone presents to the um, shelter and we don't have good baseline health like Tim was talking about, there can be some consequences to that. And I'll give you an example. One of the um, speech therapists that we work with had a, had a brother with cerebral palsy, pretty severe. He was able to communicate but it was verbally, but it was very slow and difficult to understand. 
He also had a lot of anatomical abnormalities because of his uh, disabilities. And so he, um, he was contractured. His abdomen and chest were kind of like off to the side. So it looked, you know, he had some pretty tough times and difficulty breathing. He was in a car accident. And when he got to the emergency room, he was laying in the bed waiting for a family member to come. He's his own advocate, but sometimes when you can't talk, people are in a hurry, you need your advocate. The nurses and doctors, a lot of them were freaking because they thought when they did the x-rays that the car accident caused the displacement of all of those organs in, in the body. He was trying to tell them, no, that's my normal, that's my baseline, that's how, that's how I am. But because he, in an emergency situation, people are in a hurry, and sometimes individuals with developmental disabilities are not heard. So it is important to know those baseline information. People with DD mirror, mirror on other individuals that may be in the shelters. Think about, again, people with mental health issues that you've seen some behaviors with, people who have Alzheimer's, people who are elderly and may be confused. Think of the typical population. Both of my children have developmental disabilities, but I'll tell you what, sometimes I'd rather have um, some of our folks coming in where you're not quite so sure than my son, who could be pretty disruptive in a shelter, not in a bad way, but in a way that he wants to help. A lot of our individuals are cooperative, compliant, and communicative. Um, Keep in mind that individuals with developmental disabilities, especially our older folks, have been in situations and institutions before they came out where they were verbally, sexually, and physically abused. So a lot of times they will answer yes to almost every question that you have. Myth number four is people with de de developmental disabilities can access health care easily. Premise. Health care providers may have to adapt their physical environment and interaction techniques. I think they said that the normal physician practice is one physician to about 800 patients, and for individuals with developmental disabilities, they suggest it's one physician to 350 individuals. So you can see that they are time-consuming individuals, because partly because of communication, partly because of mobility, um, partly because of the special needs that they have. So if you are working with an individual with developmental disabilities, talk to the person rather than through the caregiver or sign language interpreter. The individual may not look like they can talk, they may not look like they can understand, but nothing aggravates an individual with developmental disabilities more than when they go to a doctor's office in this case, possibly visiting a shelter, and all communication will go towards uh, the caregiver or the interpreter. Um, if the caregiver needs to be involved, if the individual isn't verbal, or if you really cannot understand the individual need to get specific information, ask the individual if it's okay to include the caregiver in, um, in the conversation. Listen patiently. Don't complete sentences for the person unless he or she looks to you for help. Again, allow extra time for a visit and give specific directions. Don't pretend that you understand something the individual is saying just to be polite, because you may miss a valuable piece of information. Be prepared for the individual to be using various techniques and devices used to enhance or augment speech. People who use these devices become very defensive um, and offended if you do not talk to them using the, the device that they have. An example is, um, I was director of nursing for a 60 bed facility that had, we had 60 people with developmental disabilities ranging from three months to 42 years old. One of them was a young lady who had cerebral palsy. She could not talk, but she had a touch talker that she could operate and could communicate very well with the touch talker. My son at the time was about 10 or 11, and he came up to see me at my office. And as he passed the young lady, he said to me, why does she have that thing on her wheelchair? She typed out to him, why don't you ask me that question? Mm -hmm. 
some general communication strategies. Um, I presented some of this with a speech to biologists, and she said, remember no USSR. So that's how I remember some of this communication. Nurture. Develop a trusting and supportive environment as much as you can. I understand that in an emergency situation and you're just in a disaster and you're trying to triage a person that you don't know, you don't know their ability, but the number one thing to do is to stay calm and just remember they have a lot of the abilities that we have and some of the disabilities that some of the other folks that you're going to be working with also have. Show an interest in communicating with them and act and speak as naturally as you can. I don't know why it is, but people who have hearing disabilities and people who have developmental disabilities, it seems like a lot of um, medical personnel shout so that they will hear. You know, a lot of our folks can hear. It's just that they can't necessarily communicate in the same way as we do. To keep people calm, communicate on what is exactly happening now. And then provide choices. One of the things that people with developmental disabilities, and I think people all, all together, is if you can provide a choice. Maybe it's a just, just a choice about do you want to go in this room or do you want to go in this room? Um, or do you want to have Susie help you or do you want to have Mary help you? It gives them the feeling that they are, they do have a little bit of control over their situation. You. You always play a key role in, in assuring effective communication. Don't be afraid of our folks. They just look different. Their speech sometimes is different, and their disability may be frightening. Talk to the person. Again, ask permission to talk to whoever is assisting them. Listen to what they have to say. Clarify if you don't understand, and restate so that you do understand what they're saying. Be sensitive. Recognize an individual's readiness to communicate. Respond at the person's level. Recognize, and these are things we do all the time, if a child would come in, you'd act differently than if an elderly person would come in. So be at the person's level as much as you can. Recognize the communication modes of the individual. Do they need sign language? Do they, do they need an interpreter? And then respond, respond appropriately to all communicative attempts. You're the sender. Get the person's attention. If someone's deaf, pat them on the shoulder. Present the info using the person's receptive mode. So find out what their communication is and then present the, the information to them so that they can understand it. Repeat the message once. If they don't seem to understand, repeat it, maybe using a different way to communicate. You can, refer, re, you can rephrase using different words or sometimes different modes of communication. Sometimes individuals will understand sign language, but because of physical disabilities, cannot communicate that way, so they have to communicate in a different way. And recognize all attempts to respond. A lot of times it takes individuals with developmental disabilities longer to respond and we're in a hurry and, and not respecting that it takes them longer. It frustrates them. It actually makes the process longer. Three adults as adults. I think that's the biggest complaint the individuals that we work with. Um, have about they are adults, they can't make decisions. Like I said, some have master's degrees, hold down jobs, and do not shout at the person with developmental disabilities. As the receiver, pay attention to the individual, to what they're saying, what they're not saying, and nonverbal cues. Ask for clarification when needed, and be honest. If you don't know something, tell them you don't know, but you'll find out. Encourage the individual to use many modes of communication. Next slide is more specific to cognitive disabilities. Use very clear and specific information, language, I'm sorry. Be patient. Allow the person time to tell you or show you what he wants or needs. And I know in these situations it's very difficult. Condense lengthy directions into steps because a lot of people cannot handle more than one uh, instruction at a time, and use short, concise instructions that they understand. 
present verbal information at a relatively slow pace with appropriate pauses so that they can process the information that you're giving them. Use repetition as necessary and then give them something to um, gauge what's going on, like we will have lunch in five minutes. We're going to put you in, in the area where you're going to spend time in four or five minutes, ten minutes, so that they, they're not just sitting there waiting for someone to communicate with them. You can reinforce information with pictures or other visual images, and it doesn't have to be pictures that are real comprehensive. You could draw something. That may be a way that they will understand. You can use modeling, rehearsing, and role-playing. That works in concrete rather than abstract language. And a lot of our folks do not either understand or appreciate use of sarcasm or even subtle humor, especially in a disaster situation. And then if you're just not sure what to say or do, just ask the person what he or she needs. A lot of times they'll be able to communicate that to you in one way or the other, as long as you are as the receptor are looking at verbal and nonverbal cues. The other thing that people are afraid of when working with people with developmental disabilities are behavior issues. Some of our folks, and I would say more and more of our folks, have dual diagnosis, and Kathy explained that to you, that they could have both a mental illness and a developmental disability. And we do spend a lot of time trying to figure out with individuals are they frustrated because of something with their physical condition or is what's going on, on with them more related to their mental condition or mental illness? Our folks do have an increased incidence of dual diagnosis and the thought process behind that is with a developmental intellectual disability, there may be some type of problem with the functioning of the brain that may also cause problems with um, mental illness can also trigger that kind of thing. There's just something not working right in the brain. So it may be intellectual disabilities along with developmental disabilities. And those folks can be difficult to work with at times. Next slide, behavioral issues. <clears throat> this was a quote I liked. Unlike the general population, individuals with a dual diagnosis may be more likely to exhibit signs and symptoms of their disorders in the form of behavioral outbursts including verbal or physical aggression, self-injury, property destruction, impulsive behaviors, and or elopement, elopement. And we do see that a lot of times with our nonverbal folks because they can't tell you what's going on. Sometimes we're not understanding what's going on. So the way that they demonstrate is through some of their behaviors that they're frustrated that we can't understand. By elopement, you mean running away, running out of the facility? Yes. Yes. It's not uncommon for people with pervasive developmental disorders or autism to, to display aggressive behaviors. A lot of that time, a lot of that is because they cannot effectively communicate what's going on with them and they become very frustrated. Or they could be having pain, or they could just have limited communication skills, or the receiver of the information is not understanding. For individuals who are nonverbal, Behaviors may be their way of expressing frustration and or pain. And when we have an individual who's nonverbal or acting out aggressively, one of the biggest things that we do at the very beginning is to check them out medically because a lot of time it's due to pain. We can work a behavior plan for the individual. We can offer all kinds of choices, but if it's pain and they can't express that, none of those other interventions are going to work. And things can be very subtle when an individual has pain. We get need to know how an individual expresses that. For example, I think that's coming up on my next slide. For example, we had an individual who always had a, um, they always did self-injurious behavior because they were frustrated they couldn't communicate. And they would hit themselves on the side of the face with their hands so much that they detached a retina of one of their eyes. We were able to work a behavior plan and that behavior stopped, but they started to take their hand then and punch under, underneath their jaw and kept punching. And none of, the, none of the interventions that we were 
using were working, here they had an excess too. So we thought at first they were demonstrating their behavior um, that we were going to use a behavior plan for, but just that taking a hand to a fist and doing just a small different area on the face meant a big, big difference in the intervention that we used for the individual. That behavior stopped as soon as the abscess was treated. How do you cope with behaviors during a disaster? Anybody who's worked in the shelter or an emergency situation with the general population use a lot of these techniques. Everything is, uh, a lot of times, it's very hectic, it's disruptive, it's confusing. Stay calm. Just stay calm. Use verbal and nonverbal techniques, including relaxed body positions. Again, a lot of the techniques that we use with typ typical population. You can limit space by directing the person to another room or area away from others. Sometimes that's enough to calm them down. People with autism and some mental health disorders become very aggressive or demonstrate behaviors when there's too much stimulus. So if you can get them off to a room by themselves or with much less noise, much less stimulation, that could, that could de-escalate their behavior. A soothing tone of voice and avoid giving commands. Identify their feelings if able, if they're able to communicate. Um, if the caregiver is with them and can tell you what they're feeling, then you would be able to, to maybe match the intervention to assist with that behavior. Ask the caregiver for assistance. They may be aware of behaviors that are done to de-escalate aggressive behaviors. Some of our folks have very distinct involved behavior plans. And I would think that, for the most part, our people who are either medically involved or people who have severe behaviors would be accompanied to a shelter by a caregiver. So they would be the ones that could interpret a lot of what they're doing and give you information. If you could redirect to an activity, preferably something more soothing for the individual than the chaos that may be going around them. Self-injurious behavior, I talked about that a little bit. Um, people who are nonverbal, people who have autism, um, they may express their autism by self-injurious behaviors. They do head banging. They could hit themselves. They could bite themselves. And again, the interventions would be the same as previously discussed. Just a final word. People with DD are individuals with families, jobs, hobbies, likes and dislikes, problems and joys. While the disability is an integral part of who they are, it alone does not define them. Don't make them into a dis disability heroes or victims. Treat them as individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Cuyahoga County. As an employee at the Cleveland Clinic, we can connect with uh, a place that's in, I believe it's Texas. And if somebody has any special needs, if we were in an emergency, we have the luxury of having a TV or a uh, telephone connection, they can offer assistance uh, like within three minutes. It is an awesome program. I have to get you the name of it. Okay. And if somebody uh, has to do sign language, it's just a, a wonderful program. And we've used it many times for hearing impairment, for blind, I mean, whatever we need. And I'll get you that name and number. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all three of our presenters from the Board of Developmental Disabilities. You've educated us, we hope.